And the two issues that lay at the foundation of this rebellion and this battle called Armageddon is the law of God and the righteousness of Christ. And every living being who has ever lived on this earth and every angel acknowledges that God is right and the devil is wrong. The battle has been won and Jesus has won the war in righteousness. Hi, thank you for joining me. This three-part video series takes a close look at what the Bible actually says about the Battle of Armageddon. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of speculation, there are a lot of questions in the world right now. Has Armageddon started? Is it about to begin? How will it end? How do I know that I will end up on the right side? We're going to take a close look at what the Bible says. I invite you to go to our website at pathwaytoparadise.org download the handouts. They're absolutely free. There's one for each of these three videos in this series. So look for the Armageddon and the Seal of God handouts. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we open your word and see the message that you have for us today, we ask that you will send your Holy Spirit, that you will give us understanding, discernment, and wisdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of this first session is Armageddon and the Seal of God, How God Makes War. We're going to take a close look at several passages in the book of Revelation. We're going to see what God's message is for us today. And I believe that you will see that this is a very timely message and God absolutely can predict the future. Nothing takes him by surprise. Now, there is only one passage and one verse where we actually find the word Armageddon in the Bible, and that's found in Revelation chapter 16. So we will begin reading in Revelation chapter 16 and verse number 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So Revelation chapter 16, verse 16, is the only verse in the Bible where we actually find the name Armageddon. However, as this, and this will become clear as we study through these three sessions, the topic of Armageddon actually runs throughout the entire Bible. And what we find in this passage and others in the book of Revelation is a climax and a culmination of this battle called Armageddon. So I hope you have your handout. We're going to start with question number one now, and that is, how does God make war? How does God make war? If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible, we will have most of these verses, verses no, um, though not all of them, on the screen. In Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11, we find one of Revelation's many descriptions of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And let's read verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So, does God make war? Yes, he does. The Bible makes it very clear that God makes war, but he makes war very differently than we do. He makes war in righteousness. So you can see the three bold-faced words that we have on the screen here. In the first session, we're going to focus on how God makes war. In the second session, we're going to focus on the judgment of God. And in the third and final session, we're going to be looking at um, righteousness. 
What is righteousness? What is the symbol or sign of righteousness for our world today? We'll be seeing how these issues all tie together. Okay, question number two. Where did the battle between sin and righteousness begin? We're going to go to another chapter in the book of Revelation. This is Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 sits at the very heart, in the middle of the book of Revelation. And uh, this is one of the clues for us that Revelation chapter 12 is incredibly important. Revelation 12 begins with John seeing in vision a woman. She's dressed in white. She's standing on the moon. There's uh, a crown of 12 stars around her. It's a beautiful woman. She's wearing beautiful garments. And um, as the vision continues, there is a red dragon that is uh, attempting to attack the woman as well as her baby because the woman is pregnant. And the woman gives birth to a baby. The baby is caught up to God's throne. So clearly the baby represents Jesus Christ. And then some other things happen to the woman which we'll take a look at. But we're going to start here in Revelation chapter 12 verse 7 which goes back far in time to the beginning of this great battle or controversy between good and evil. Where did the battle between sin and righteousness begin? The Bible tells us, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. So the Bible makes it clear that the battle between sin and righteousness began in heaven with an angel named Lucifer. He was a covering cherub next to God's throne and he rebels against his creator. Now the Bible gives us a couple of clues, several clues about this angel that rebels against God. One of those clues is found in the book of Isaiah chapter 14. So we're going to go there, Isaiah chapter 14 and beginning in verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north." So this angel that stands beside God's throne as a covering cherub, he rebels against God because he decides he wants to be like God or even be greater than God. He wants the worship that is due to God alone. And notice what he says, he wants to sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now in the Hebrew, the Hebrew words translated as mount of the congregation is har, which means mountain, and moed, which means congregation. So the mount of the congregation is har moed. And many scholars believe that this may be the root, the Hebrew word, uh, root for the word Armageddon. We will investigate that further as we continue our studies. But this angel rebels against God. God's throne is on a great mountain in heaven. And Lucifer wants to exalt his throne above the stars of heaven, above the throne of God. So what two things did God place Lucifer next to in heaven? Let's take a closer look at the position and the job that Lucifer had in heaven because this will help us to understand what lies at the root and at the foundation of this great controversy between good and evil. So we're going to go to another Old Testament uh, prophetic book. This is the book of Ezekiel, and Ezekiel chapter 28 has a very fascinating passage. Ezekiel 28, beginning in verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So, this verse tells us that Lucifer was a covering cherub. He was an anointed cherub. And God set him there because he wanted him to have this specific job. Now, the Bible tells us that God knows everything, and the Bible makes it clear that God can predict the future. Now, if you or I had been God, knowing what this angel would eventually do and rebel against God, 
we probably would not have placed Lucifer as close as possible to the throne as, as God did. You and I probably would have placed Lucifer as far out on the outskirts of the universe as possible so that when he did rebel, he would cause as little damage as possible. But that is not what God did. God placed him right next to his throne as a covering cherub. Now, why did God do that? Well, we're going to look at another Bible passage that helps us to understand more about this position that Lucifer had by God's throne. When Moses told Israel and the Israelites to build a sanctuary in the wilderness, God made it clear that that sanctuary was simply a model or a replica of the real sanctuary in heaven. And the book of Hebrews makes this crystal clear that the real sanctuary, the real temple, is the one in heaven that God pitched. So let's take a look here at Exodus chapter 25, beginning in verse 21. God is speaking to Moses. And he says, Thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. Now the testimony is the King James, one of the King James words for the Ten Commandments, or the law of God. So the Ten Commandments, the divine law of God, were contained inside the Ark of the Covenant. They were inside the box itself. Now what else was there around the Ark of the Covenant? And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims. So God's law was there, and also God's glory. Let's take a closer look at this. God's law is the diagnosis of sin. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 7, verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So, the law of God provides the definition of sin. And as Paul makes it clear here, we wouldn't even recognize our own sin in our lives if it were not for the presence of the law of God that says, Don't lust, or don't steal, or don't kill, or don't do this. The law of God is the diagnosis of sin. What about this light that was shining where God would meet with Moses or meet with the high priest there in the uh, most holy place? Well, God's glory or his righteousness is the cure for sin. Psalm 97 verse 6 says, The heavens declare his righteousness and all the people see his glory. So the glory of God, that bright shining light, was a representation of the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it is only God's righteousness, right? His power, His ability to do good, to do what is right. It's His righteousness that is the cure for sin. The Bible says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there is nothing we can do of ourselves in our own power to be righteous or to save ourselves. It only comes from God. So God placed Lucifer next to his throne where he saw uh, his job day and night was to stare into the law of God, that's the diagnosis of sin, and he was to stare day and night into the glory of God, that's the uh, righteousness of Christ, the cure for sin as well. Now why did God do that? The Bible tells us that God is love. Yes, God knows everything, but he leaves his creatures with free choice. All of his intelligent creatures, human beings, angels, he gives us free choice. And yes, God knew that this angel Lucifer would one day rebel against him, but God loved him and he would not force him to obey him or to serve him. And so he gives him free choice, but he does place him in the one spot in the entire universe where his job is to stare day and night into the cure or into the diagnosis and the cure for sin. And that is a God of love. Now, the name Lucifer means light bearer. And it wasn't his own light. He was merely reflecting the light from God's glory. And um, I'm surmising here a little bit, but one day Lucifer started looking at himself. He saw this shining light coming off of him. And he forgot that he was reflecting God's glory, and he started thinking that it was his own glory, his own power, his own righteousness, 
And that's when this thing called sin began welling up in Lucifer's heart. And eventually it manifested itself in open revolt against God. But God had created Lucifer to reflect his glory. Now this is interesting because when God created humanity, when he made Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he gave them a similar um, representation of his glory, and that was a robe of light. So we read here from the book Experiences in Australia by Ellen White, page 150, Adam and Eve, after they had transgressed, saw that they were naked. The garment that had covered them and represented the righteousness of Christ departed when they sinned. So God created Adam and Eve with this robe of light which represented his righteousness. When they chose to sin, that robe of light disappeared. They realized they were naked, and we know what happened next. The Bible tells us they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. Now, were Adam and Eve the only ones of God's creatures that had this robe of light or robe of righteousness about them? The answer is no. From the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 45, we read this. The sinless pair wore no artificial garments. They were clothed with a covering of light and glory such as the angels wear. So long as they lived in obedience to God, this robe of light continued to enshroud them. So the angels were given the same robe of light that Adam and Eve had. In other words, God never intended for Lucifer or any of the other angels to serve and obey him out of their own power. He always wanted them to rely on his righteousness and on the righteousness of Christ. And when Lucifer forgot that, when he rejected the righteousness of Christ, that is where this great battle between sin and righteousness began. Another statement from the book Desire of Ages, page 761. Lucifer in heaven had sinned in the light of God's glory. To him as to no other created being was given a revelation of God's love. Understanding the character of God, knowing his goodness, Satan chose to follow his own selfish, independent will. This choice was final. There was no more that God could do to save him. But man was deceived. His mind was darkened by Satan's sophistry. The height and depth of the love of God he did not know. For him there was hope and a knowledge of God's love. By beholding his character, he might be drawn back to God. So the battle of Armageddon really began a long time ago in heaven when Lucifer rebels against God. And the two issues that lay at the foundation of this rebellion and this battle called Armageddon is the law of God and the righteousness of Christ. Those are the two things that Lucifer turned away from in heaven. And those are the two things we will see that lie at the heart of the battle here at the end of time. Yes, Armageddon includes very physical and real aspects to it. And there, is, there has been at times literal fighting and there will be literal fighting as well. But we cannot ignore the spiritual part of the battle of Armageddon. If we do, we will completely miss the most important warnings in the Bible that we have for us today. Next question, where did the battle move next? So it began in heaven. Lucifer rebels against God. He manages to get some angels to rebel with him. What happens next? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 12 and pick up the story in verse number 9. And the, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The name Satan literally means accuser. And so Lucifer, the one who was to reflect and represent God's glory, becomes the accuser, the one who is fighting against God and anybody who tries to serve God as well. And Lucifer and his angels are cast out from heaven. You know, Jesus told his disciples at one point that he had seen Lucifer falling like lightning from heaven. And Lucifer and his angels are cast out into the earth. And now this is where the battle continues 
here on earth. Now, we're going to uh, look at a few points here in regards to the battle on earth. <clears throat> Number one, God's throne and his sanctuary in heaven is his habitation. So, we're going to turn to the book of Exodus and look at a little bit of the Song of Moses, Exodus chapter 15. And this is going to shed some light for us about where God's habitation is in heaven and uh, what the setting is for his habitation. So in Exodus chapter 15, God has just rescued and saved the Israelites in the Red Sea. The Egyptian army has been demolished by the waters of the Red Sea, and now they are singing a song of praise. And this is what Moses says, Exodus chapter 15, beginning in verse 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. So God was not content just to let the Israelites uh, sit there on the shore of the Red Sea and say, congratulations, you've made it. No, he was bringing them to a specific place, and that place is the place of his habitation. Okay, what is that place? Let's jump a few verses uh, to verse 16 and 17. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm they shall be as still as a stone, until thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Now, a few days before this, as God led them out of Egypt, that was the beginning of the Passover um, celebration, the yearly Passover. And it was in remembrance of the night that God passed over the homes of those that had placed the blood of the sacrificial animal on their doorposts. In obedience to God's command and by exercising faith in, in the blood. Of course, it wasn't the blood of the animal that saved them, but it was pointing forward to the blood of Jesus, the only sacrifice that would ever matter. Uh, the, that destroying angel would pass over the homes of those that had obeyed God in faith, and so they were saved. But <clears throat> there's a greater Passover here. God is trying to get Israel out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, or through the Red Sea, and he is trying to pass them over to another place or another experience. Verse 17 tells us what that is. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. So, the sanctuary is the place of God's habitation. And um, this is the place where God had placed Lucifer as well, right? He was a covering cherub represented by those two golden cherubs in the most holy place of the sanctuary. And spiritually speaking, this is where God is trying to bring each one of us, everyone who claims to love and serve God, who chooses to accept Jesus as their Savior, God is trying to bring them into the place of His sanctuary. Not literally right now on this earth, but spiritually we can live with Jesus by faith there in the most holy place. It's an amazing promise. So the battle on earth, God's throne and sanctuary in heaven, is his habitation. Now Satan and his angels are cast out of heaven, so they leave the place of God's habitation. There's a fascinating verse in Jude 6. There's only one chapter in Jude, so we'll just say Jude verse 6, which tells us this. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Now they fell from heaven, but Jude 6 says that they left the place of their habitation. But heaven is God's habitation. Here's the point. When they rejected God's law and the righteousness of Christ, that was no longer their habitation. And so they fell to earth and this is now called the place of their habitation. It's interesting also here in verse 6 that the Bible says that the devil and his angels are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. So they are trapped here on earth at this point. They cannot leave and they are awaiting judgment and eventual destruction as a penalty for their sin. But the battle has moved to earth when Lucifer and his angels rejected God's law and righteousness, they became 
earth dwellers. That's, that's my main point here, is that they became earth dwellers rather than heaven dwellers. And if you go back to Revelation chapter 12, we see that the final battle, which is the battle of Armageddon, takes place between earth dwellers and heaven dwellers. Those that, like Satan and his angels, have rejected the law of God and the righteousness of Christ on one side, and on the other side, those that recognize the authority of God's law and claim Christ's righteousness as the power in their lives. So, Revelation 12, verse 6 says that the final battle of the great controversy is between two laws and two standards of righteousness. Humanity will be divided between those that keep God's law and claim Christ's righteousness and those that do not. Revelation refers to these groups as heaven dwellers and earth dwellers. That's actually Revelation 12, verse 12. Rejoice, therefore, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. You see the two groups described here. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time. In Revelation chapter 13, we see the same two groups of people referred to. In Revelation 13, verse 5, we read this about the beast power that comes out of the sea. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Verse 6, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Yes, the devil and this beast power is angry against God. It's angry against the angels that still remain in heaven. But it's also angry and it is also fighting against human beings here on earth that serve God. And so we can be heaven dwellers by faith even as we live here physically on earth. Look, one last verse, Revelation 13, verse 8. says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, that's the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All those that dwell upon earth, the earth dwellers, will end up worshiping the beast, receiving the mark of the beast, and end up being on the wrong side of the battle of Armageddon. Next question. What three things enable us to overcome in this great controversy battle, in this battle of Armageddon? Praise God, He gives us some tools, some weapons of warfare to fight with. And these are weapons of righteousness because God makes war in righteousness. You know, Jesus said to Pilate when he was standing there in front of that Roman governor about to be crucified, Jesus said, my, my kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this world. If it were, my servants would fight, but it's not. And then Jesus talks about truth. And so even there in that setting, Jesus makes it clear that the way he makes war, the way he sets up his kingdom is not through bloodshed. It's not through all of the atrocities of war that we see here on this earth. When the Bible talks about God making war, it's really talking about how God works in righteousness. Because righteousness will defeat evil at the end of the day. What are the three things that will enable you, that enable us to overcome in this great controversy battle? We read them in Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame him, that is, the dragon, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So there are three things, incredibly important things in this verse. Three tools, three weapons. The blood of the Lamb is one. The word of their testimony is a second thing. And the fact that they loved not their lives unto the death. You know, our fight is already lost if we fail to recognize and admit that our only hope of salvation is through Jesus Christ. We have to start there at that point, at the blood of the Lamb. The battle is already over if we do not accept Jesus as our Savior and as our King. And you know, a lot of people are, are eager and willing to accept Jesus as their Savior, right? Because who wouldn't love to live forever? But not everybody is willing and ready to accept Jesus as their King. Because a King has authority in a person's life. And when you accept Jesus as your Savior and your King, 
That means that you are giving up control of your life to the one who died for you. And that can sound like a scary thing to do. But if you remember that Jesus is the one who gave his life so that you could live, there is no better choice that you can make. So we have to start at that point. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Now, we're going to look at another verse at the end of this chapter. This is Revelation 12, verse 17. What about this word of their testimony? This verse is speaking about the very end of time. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. If you choose to accept Jesus as your Savior, if you recognize the Bible as God's word of authority in your life, and uh, if you have made that decision to follow Jesus and to try to live like him, then you are part of the remnant of the woman's seed and the devil is angry with you. Now what do we read? The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Remember the two uh, foundational parts of the uh, aspects of this fight between good and evil, the battle of Armageddon, is the law of God and the righteousness of Christ. And we see them reflected right here. The remnant of the woman's seed keep the commandments of God and they also have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to have the testimony of Jesus Christ? The Greek word that is translated as the word have is the word echo. Now, in English, it kind of loses its power, right? Because when we use the word have, that's a very passive verb. It's a very passive type of action, right? Oh, I have this, I, I, I have that. It kind of means that you have something in your possession, but you're not actively doing anything with it. But in Greek, that word is very, very different. It is the word echo. And you know what an echo is, right? You, you yell or you clap your hands, you make a loud noise, and if there's anything that it can reflect against, that exact sound will come echoing back to you. It's a very active word, and it means that this remnant of the woman's seed echoes the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, if I were to yell loud enough, right, against a canyon wall or some buildings, whatever I said, would, the echo would contain the exact same words that I said, maybe just a little bit softer and of course with the delay. But you're not going to get a completely different uh, sentence coming back to you. And if you yelled out a question and the echo contained the reply, well, you'd have something to worry about, right? The echo is an exact copy of the original. The Bible is telling us that the remnant of the woman's seed will keep the commandments of God, which, by the way, is what Jesus did in his life on earth, and they will also echo the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what was the testimony of Jesus Christ, right? What was Jesus Christ's testimony about himself when he was on earth? Whatever Jesus' testimony was about how he lived life is going to be the testimony that this remnant of the woman's seed should have in their lives. Turn with me, if you have your Bible, we're going to go to John chapter 14. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples here in this passage and he is explaining to them how he has lived his life on earth. John chapter 14, beginning in verse number 25. And we'll see several things that Jesus says about himself. Beginning in verse 25, Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. Jesus was about to depart from them in death. And he wasn't going to have that same continual um, connection with them that he had had before. And so this is one of the last things that Jesus says. By the way, if you know you're about to die, what kinds of things do you say? Do you talk about the weather? you talk about your favorite sports team? No, you talk about the most important things in life. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He is sharing his testimony. So what does Jesus say? He goes on in verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. 
The first point is simply this, that Jesus lived his earthly life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, that says that after Jesus came up out of the water in baptism, he was full of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit led him into the wilderness. And everything Jesus did, everything he said, everywhere he went, was under the guidance and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's how Jesus lived his life. Are we given the same promise that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, in fact, that God wants us to receive the Holy Spirit in our lives? The answer, of course, is absolutely yes. Uh, Jesus talked a lot about the Holy Spirit with his disciples in this very conversation. He kept coming back to their need of the Holy Spirit, the fact that the Father wanted to give the Holy Spirit. This is the greatest gift that God can give after the death of his Son on the cross. And so, yes, we can echo this part of Christ's testimony. We can also be filled with the Holy Spirit if we ask, if we allow God to do this, and we can live a life that is uh, powered and driven and led by the Holy Spirit. What does Jesus say next in verse 27? Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. Jesus had peace and freedom from fear. You might remember the story when Jesus was crossing the lake with his disciples, and a great storm comes up. And the disciples are afraid that the storm is going to sink their ship and that they are all going to die. And they turn around after furiously trying to steer the ship and bail water out. And in fear of death, they turn around and they look at Jesus. And there he is sleeping peacefully in the back of that boat. Now, how was Jesus able to do this? Another story, right? In fact, it was the next morning. They make it safely across the sea because Jesus stands up and he says, peace be still. He's not afraid of the elements. The next morning, they find themselves standing face to face with a demon-possessed man. The disciples run in terror, but Jesus stands right there and the demon is cast out. Jesus lived his life in peace and freedom from fear. Is it possible for us to do the same? You know, I've heard it said that the Bible contains 365 promises about why we should not fear. God wants us to know every single day, every moment in fact, that when we put our faith in Him, our trust in Him, we don't have to be afraid, we don't have to live fearfully in our lives. And yeah, this world is full of things that we uh, can be fearful of. It is full of uh, tragedy and atrocity and destruction. And we need something we need a power within us that can help us to navigate life without being fearful. And God promises to give us that. So yes, we can echo that part of Christ's testimony as well. In verse 28, Jesus says this, You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And so Jesus lived his life giving glory to the Father in everything he did. Now, are we called to do the same? As Christians, we are called to have the same mindset, to make the same decisions as Jesus did that will allow our Heavenly Father to be glorified in our lives. This was one of the basic mistakes that Lucifer made in heaven. He stopped giving glory to God and he started wanting to receive that glory and worship for himself. So, yes, we are called to do the same thing, to echo this part of Christ's testimony as well. Verse 29 is next. Jesus said, And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Jesus is talking here about prophecy and the importance of prophecy. Now, the Old Testament is full of prophecies about the Messiah. Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies in his life. Some of those maybe he wasn't consciously trying to fulfill, but many of them he made conscious decisions to either go somewhere or do something or say something that would fulfill a specific prophecy. And so here's the point. Jesus lived his life in such a way that it would fulfill prophecy. 
He valued prophecy. He recognized the importance of it. And we are called to, uh, to do the same thing as well. No, there may not be hundreds of Bible prophecies that point specifically to your life like they did Jesus. But God has given us the word of prophecy contained in the Bible. He expects us to read it, to study it, to understand it with His help, and then again with His power and through faith to order our lives so that our lives are a fulfillment of Bible prophecy as well. How is that true? Because God has promised that He will have people at the end of time that are choosing to serve Him and that are willing to serve Him uh, even if it means giving something up, surrendering something that is valuable or important to them, even if it means persecution, even if it means death. Revelation 12 verse 11, don't forget that verse, they love not their lives unto the death. So yes, we are called to echo this part of Christ's testimony as well. We are called to believe in the Word of God and in prophecy. Now in verse 30, Jesus says this, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and he has nothing in me. What is Jesus saying here? He is telling his disciples that the devil is about to come at him with his final set of temptations, right? This was the last chance that the devil had, and the devil knew it. And so he was going to come at Jesus with everything he had, trying to get him to doubt God, to doubt the Word of God, the promises of God, the prophecies of God, trying to get Jesus to give in to sin and temptation. And Jesus says here that there, he has no foothold, Satan has no foothold in his life, and that he would have no response to temptation. Now, is that possible in our lives? Now, there are promises in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, that says, There is no temptation that hath taken man except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. God has promised that when you reach out to Him and lay hold on His power and claim His promises, the devil cannot touch you. Sin and temptation will lose their power. Even habits that have followed you in your life for decades can lose their power when Jesus is at work in your life. And so, yes, we are called to echo this part of Christ's testimony as well. And then Jesus finishes in verse 31 by saying this, But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise and let us go. Jesus ends his testimony by explaining his faithful obedience to God's law, even unto death. When you look at the book of Revelation, the final issues here on earth, such as the mark of the beast and the battle of Armageddon, the law of God keeps popping up, and it's always in connection with those who are faithfully serving God. The law of God, we have already seen, lies at the foundation of the battle of Armageddon. It was one of the two fundamental issues at the beginning of this battle when Lucifer rebelled against God, and it will be a fundamental issue all the way to the very end. Do I recognize God's authority? Will I recognize His law as the standard of righteousness in my life? This is how Jesus lived. And if we are to echo His testimony, then that same attitude must be reflected in our lives as well. Revelation 12 verse 17 tells us that the dragon is wroth with the remnant of the woman's seed because they, have, they keep the commandments of God and they are echoing that testimony of Jesus Christ. So there's good news. It is possible. It's possible in your life when you ask God to make it a reality for you. Prophets and Kings, page 725 says, Clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church is to enter upon her final conflict. This is the battle of Armageddon being referred to. The church is the remnant of the woman's seed, and Christ's righteousness is His testimony being echoed and lived out in their lives. There is only one way we can hope 
to survive through this battle of Armageddon, which is rapidly rolling upon us, and that is to be clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness. We must be echoing the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here's another statement. A terrible conflict is before us. We are nearing the battle of the great day of God Almighty. That which has been held in control is to be let loose. The angel of mercy is folding her wings, preparing to step down from the throne and leave the world to the control of Satan. The principalities and powers of earth are in bitter revolt against the God of heaven. They are filled with hatred against those who serve him. And soon, very soon, will be fought the last great battle between good and evil. The earth is to be the battlefield, the scene of the final contest and the final victory. While their hands were loosening and the four winds were about to blow, the merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed, and He raised His hands to the Father and pleaded with Him that He had spilled His blood for them. Then another angel was commissioned to fly swiftly to the four angels and bid them hold until the servants of God were sealed with the seal of the living God in their foreheads. Why hasn't the battle of Armageddon already happened? Why hasn't the end of all things already come? Because Jesus knows that His people are not yet ready to stand for Him. They have not yet received the seal of God. But the promise is given that they will be given that seal of protection before the battle of Armageddon bursts forth. In His final prayer before His crucifixion, Jesus prayed for His disciples. And He didn't pray that God would whisk them out of the world or rapture them away to avoid all kinds of tribulation. Instead, Jesus prays that God will seal them and protect them and enable them to go through the crisis that is coming. John 17, verse 15, Jesus says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And how would the disciples of Christ be protected? Jesus tells us. John 17, verse 18, uh, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. The seal of God is given to us as the Holy Spirit writes the word of God, the law of God on our minds and our hearts. And as that truth is impressed upon us, not as an external checklist, but as a living reality that changes how we think and how we feel, how we respond to people, it, it changes and, uh, and transforms our motives and our desires and our goals. As that process takes place, we receive the seal of God. And God promises to do this work in our lives. What is the key issue in the battle of Armageddon? Let's um, end by looking at the passage we began with, Revelation 16, verse 15. In the middle of this warning about the battle of Armageddon, is a strange little verse which, at first glance, might appear to not really belong in a passage about demons and armies being gathered to the battle of Armageddon. Let's read this verse, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. Actually, I'm going to back up and read verse 14 for context. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That's verse 14. Verse 16 says, And He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. But in between these two references about the battle of Armageddon, we read this verse. Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. See, the battle of Armageddon, even though it will involve very real and literal things, at its heart it is a spiritual battle and it is involving this coat or armor of righteousness that we must have on. And Jesus is giving a warning to every person that claims to serve Him. As you see the battle of Armageddon approaching, make sure that you have your garments on. What is that garment? The Bible tells us. Revelation chapter 19, 
verse 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. It's not their righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ that has been placed on them and that has transformed them from sinners into saints. Remember, the law of God and the righteousness of Christ are the foundational issues in the battle of Armageddon. Prophet Isaiah wrote this, chapter 61, verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. We must have on the robe of Christ's righteousness. This is our armor in the battle of Armageddon. Last question. How will the message of righteousness by faith lead to the battle of Armageddon? Revelation 18 verse 1 says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. God's righteousness or his glory is the light that is being predicted here. And we see a, a prophecy that at the very end, right before the battle of Armageddon explodes here on planet Earth, there will be a message of Christ's righteousness, which also includes a message about the law of God, and that there will be such power in this message that it will enlighten the entire world, and people will make their final choice, will I accept God's law or man's law? Will I accept Christ's righteousness or something else? I want to read for you a statement from Testimonies to the Church, volume 6, page 19. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other, to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God which closes the work of the third angel. This isn't just my idea. We are told that the glory of, of this message, this angel in Revelation 18, verse 1, it is the message of Christ's righteousness, right? It is his testimony being echoed in the lives of those that follow him. Providence has a part to act in the battle of Armageddon. When the earth is lighted with the glory of the angel in Revelation 18, the religious elements, good and evil, will awake from slumber and the armies of the living God will take the field. We are almost there. We are almost at this point in earth's history. What is God's promise to those who overcome? Let's end with some good news. Revelation 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his, in his throne. Jesus wants to give you the thing that Lucifer wanted in heaven, and that is a throne with God sitting there in heaven. And he has promised he will give it to you as an overcomer. Just before us is the closing struggle of the great controversy when, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, Satan is to work to misrepresent the character of God that he may seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. If there ever was a people in need of constantly increasing light from heaven, it is the people that, in this time of peril, God has called to be the depositaries of His holy law and to vindicate His character before the world. Those to whom has been committed a trust so sacred must be spiritualized, elevated, vitalized by the truths they profess to believe. My friend, God wants you to be one of those soldiers in His army that is vitalized, renewed, energized by the righteousness of Christ, by the Holy Spirit making Christ's righteousness your righteousness. And God wants to wrap you in this robe of light so that your life can be a testimony to somebody else, an encouragement to somebody else. In our next session, we're going to look at both the righteousness that comes to maturity at the very end of time and also the sin that comes to maturity at the end of time. We're going to see what is happening in our world today tells us how close we are to the Battle of Armageddon. 